Well, hello everyone, how are we doing today? I hope that you are surviving the humidity because I am not personally. Not a fan of the humidity. I hope you're making it okay. Welcome again to Vineyard Church North Phoenix, and especially whether you're in the room with us or online, I particularly want to say a welcome to any of our guests. If you're here for the first time, second time, third time, we are so glad that you chose to spend part of your weekend with us here at the Vineyard. My name's Keith Shepard. I'm one of the pastors here, and we hope that you enjoy the service, but as you heard earlier, our highest hope is always that you would experience God's presence by our gathering together, that you, you already have been, that you continue to experience his presence throughout the rest of the service today. In a few moments, we're going to be pausing to receive our tithes and our offerings. So I'd like to ask the ushers to go ahead and come forward. You know, and we do this. This is one of the ways that we worship God together. We worship God together by singing songs to him and about him like we did earlier. We worship God together by learning more about him, growing in our relationship with him, by studying from his word, the Bible together. And we also worship God together by giving back to him from our finances. And when we do that, that's one of the ways that we partner with God to transform lives in our community and all around the world. So I want to thank those of you who give faithfully and generously to God through Vineyard Church North Phoenix. Your giving is making a difference. It's having an impact, and it's what allows us to be the church that we get to be. So thank you for that. Will you join me as we pray for our giving whenever we may do that, and that God would speak to us through today's teaching. Father God, we love you, we worship you, and we ask that whenever we give, that you continue to use what we give to transform lives here and in our local neighborhood, but also all around the world, God. I thank you for the privilege of being a part of this church and of partnering with you to transform lives. And God, we ask that uh, you would speak to us today as we study from the Bible. Would, we want to hear from you. Father, I ask that you would give me the gift of teaching. Let us hear from you what you want us to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, last weekend we started a two-week series called The Best Sermon Ever. And I want to be clear about something. I'm not referring to one of the sermons that I'm preaching as the best sermon ever. I'm talking about a sermon that Jesus gave in the Bible. We call it the Sermon on the Mount, and it's found in the New Testament book of Matthew in chapters 5, 6, and 7. So if you missed last week, I encourage you to get caught up. You can get a CD from the bookstore. You can go to our website, vineyardnorthphoenix.com, and listen to it. Um, but you're not going to miss out. I'm going to recap a bit of it for you right now. Central to Jesus' teaching overall and central to the Sermon on the Mount is this idea about God's kingdom. Matthew sets it up earlier in chapter 4 after Jesus' baptism and after his temptation, after his move from Nazareth up to Capernaum and Galilee. He says, from then on, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. And then in verse 23, Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. Now, this kingdom stuff is important. It's central to all of Jesus' teachings. It's central to the Sermon on the Mount. And it gives us the right lens, the right filter to better understand this sermon specifically, but all of Jesus' teaching and life and ministry in general. Now, last weekend, we really dug into the very first part of Jesus' sermon, the beginning of chapter 5. It's a section that we call the Beatitudes, and it's a series of statements from Jesus that really comes down to the values of life in God's kingdom. And the very first statement, the very first Beatitude, sets up this filter for everything else that follows. Jesus says, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. See, when we realize that the thing that we need the most, the thing that we are lacking the most of in our lives in order to be content, in order to be truly happy, when we realize that that is God and that we desperately need him, that is when God's kingdom belongs to us. That is when we truly belong to God's kingdom. 
He says God blesses those who know that they desperately need him, those who are poor for him. God blesses those who experience loss and embrace sorrow. God blesses those who elevate others and desire rightness and equity for all people and who have compassion for others who are hurting and in need. God blesses those who cultivate purity and work for peace, for wholeness, for reconciliation. In describing these kingdom values, Jesus is encouraging us to stop valuing what the world values, to stop valuing whatever we think is supposed to be of high value, and to literally turn our lives the other way, to repent. That's what that means, to turn around the other way and to cultivate these kingdom values in our lives. And as we do that, we will find that we are truly blessed by God. We will find that we are truly happy in the deepest sense of happiness. We will find that we are content and completely fulfilled. We will find that we truly belong to the kingdom of God. So today we're going to skip ahead in the Sermon on the Mount to Matthew chapter 6. If you have your Bible with you or Bible app, go ahead and open that up to Matthew 6. And you can just park there. That's where we're going to spend the bulk of our time together today. Now again, we're not covering the entirety of this this, uh, Sermon on the Mount in detail. But I encourage you, at least read the whole thing at some point. All of Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's really, really good. Today... We're going to focus on a section of Jesus' sermon where he teaches about prayer. Now, prayer is simply talking to God. It doesn't have to be anything specific. It doesn't have to have any special words or anything like that. It's just talking to God. And praying is something that, as, as followers of Jesus, we should do all the time. In fact, in the Apostle Paul's first letter to the church in Thessalonica, he wrote, never stop praying. This is an integral part of being a Christian. We talk to God on a regular basis. We pray. Jesus himself sets it up with this phrase, when you pray. And in the Sermon on the Mount, there are a few times that Jesus uses this when language. When, not if. Last week in chapter 5, we touched on God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. In chapter 6, he says, when you give to someone in need, when you pray, when you fast, there is an assumption that this is something that you're going to do. When you give, when you fast, when you pray, not if, when. In fact, Jesus uses this phrase, when you pray, three times leading up to the example prayer that we're about to get to. Verse 5, verse 6, and verse 7 all start with when you pray. And then in each of those verses, he gives an instruction of what not to do when you pray, which leads up to what to do when you pray. Beginning in verse 9 of Matthew chapter 6, the reality is, Most of the time, when we do pray, we tend to pray very safe prayers. You know, we pray things like, God, keep me healthy. Father, protect my family. Watch over us. And there's nothing wrong with those kinds of safe prayers. But if I pray like that only, well, then I'm I'm missing out on something. If if I only pray those safe prayers, then then one, I'm not following all of the instructions that Jesus gave to me. And, And two, we could be missing out on everything that God is calling us to do and to be. We are missing out on God's kingdom. So we're going to read this whole prayer first, and then we're going to talk about it. I'm going to be reading it from the New Living Translation. So this might be a little bit different than the version that you're used to hearing. Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13. This is what Jesus says. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. And forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. And depending on your religious background, you may be familiar with this particular passage of Scripture, with this prayer. You might know it as the the Lord's Prayer or the Apostles' Prayer or the Our Father. Maybe you grew up 
saying it in church regularly. I did. And this prayer is deep. And it might not seem like it on the first read. It may not seem like it particularly if you're used to just kind of saying it in church, but you aren't really thinking about it. But when you take the time to think about every sentence and every word and the the whole prayer in context with itself, with the theme of of Jesus' ministry in mind, particularly the theme of, of the Sermon on the Mount, the theme of the kingdom of God, it is deep. So we're gonna do that today for the rest of our time together. We're gonna take this one line at a time, sometimes one word at a time, and really think about and process what Jesus is teaching us with this prayer, what he is telling us by by telling us to pray in this way. So first he says, pray like this. Now we've already established that the assumption is that we as followers of Jesus, that we are prayers, right? When we pray, not if we pray. Jesus is assuming, and I am assuming, that praying is something that you as a follower of Jesus, that you do regularly. This statement, pray like this, is an instruction. Jesus is saying, I'm already assuming that you're praying. I've told you what not to do. So when you do it, this is how you should do it. It's a command. Pray like this. Now notice that it's pray like this. This is a pattern. When you pray, it should resemble this prayer. You don't have to say these exact words, although you certainly can. But your praying should be similar to this. It should incorporate at least some of the ideas, some of the expressions, requests, and truths that this prayer contains. Praying a prayer like this reveals several truths about God. And it reveals several truths about our relationship with him and the things that he calls us to do. First, it reveals the truth that God is our Father. Jesus says, our Father in heaven. Right from the start, Jesus frames God in a paternal light. Jesus invokes the idea of of a family, something personal, something loving. An instruction to pray like this, an instruction to pray this prayer is also an invitation into a familial relationship with God and with other people. Praying this prayer is an invitation into a new family. This prayer implies community. It implies relationship with God. It implies relationship with other people. Jesus addressed God as our Father. Jesus instructs us to pray to God as our Father, not just my Father. My Father would also be correct, both for for Jesus himself and for us, But right from the start, Jesus shows that we ought to pray in community with others who also call God Father. Even if I pray this prayer alone, if I use the words, our Father, I'm going to be reminded that followers of Jesus belong to a community. They belong to his family. So my action is to embrace my family. If you're a follower of Jesus... God is your father and you are part of a community. You cannot go it alone. You need community. You need your family. By saying our father in heaven, this phrase also implies God's holiness. See, there's automatically a distinction from our fathers on earth. Now, depending on your relationship with your earthly father. This is anywhere from a good thing to a very good thing. Some of us have great earthly fathers. That's a good thing. And our heavenly father is even better. Some of us didn't have great earthly fathers. And the good news is that our heavenly father is nothing like that. And because of that, even the idea of a father can be redeemed. Not necessarily for the benefit of a relationship with our earthly fathers, but for the benefit of better understanding and relating to our heavenly father. And see, there's this recurring phrase throughout the Bible. 
a, a recurring idea, the idea of, of in heaven and on earth. This phrase encapsulates everything that there is, everything that exists, everything that we can see on earth, everything that we can't see in heaven. We cannot see God the Father. He is in heaven. So he is different from an earthly father. There is an implied contrast with an earthly father because God is our father in heaven. There is a distinction about the dominion of God in heaven, God's kingdom in heaven, the complete rule and reign of God in heaven versus the dominion of the world, ruled by the prince of this world, the devil. Which actually leads to the next truth that this prayer reveals about God. God is holy. Jesus says, may your name be kept holy. And do you know what the word holy means? We use it a lot in church. We use it a lot as Christians, but, but do you know what the word holy really means? It essentially means other. Other. Set apart. It distinguishes one thing from the other thing. It's, it's the thing that stands out. It's the thing that's different. It's not this ordinary thing. It's this other thing. So Jesus says, may your name be kept holy. Not just may your name be holy or your name is holy, but may it be kept holy. The Greek word there for holy is hagiatso. It can also be translated as to make something holy. So there's an implied action on our part. Your name is holy. May we keep it holy. Your name is not an ordinary name. Let us keep it unordinary. May your name be kept different. May your name be kept distinct. May your name be kept other. So how, how is God's name kept holy? How is God's name kept other? Well, first we have to realize that his name is already holy. If we're going to keep it holy, we, it implies that it is already holy to begin with. Second, there is an action for us to take that we have to keep his name holy. My action is to keep his name holy. Now, it's really important to note that in Jewish thought, and remember, Jesus' primary audience at this point is God's chosen people, God, the Israelites, the Jewish people. In Jewish thought, knowing a person's name meant more than knowing something you could shout to get their attention. Knowing a person's name meant that they were a friend. Knowing their name meant that you could call on someone when you needed. And one of the things that God did when he called his people, when he, when he called Moses to lead his people out of slavery in the book of Exodus, one of the things that God did was he revealed his true name to them, to his people. Yahweh, I am. They were a people who knew his name. They were a people who he had identified as a friend and therefore they knew his name and they could call on him. And we, as adopted children of God through Jesus Christ, we too are a people who can call him friend. We too are a people who know his name. We too can call on him. So if it's on us, how do we keep his name holy? How do we keep his name other? We don't treat it like any other name. We don't treat it like just any other word. You know, we only say his name when we are talking to him, praying, or when we are talking about him. We keep his name holy by not being careless with it. And to me, I think this includes his actual name, but I think this includes all the things that we call him. God, Lord, it's on us, it's on you, it's on me to recognize that God's name is holy and that I have to keep it holy. And the next truth that we learn about God in this prayer is that God is king. Jesus says, May your kingdom come soon. God's kingdom is central to all of Jesus' teaching. It's central to the Sermon on the Mount. We talked a lot about God's kingdom last week as we were setting up the series. So again, if you missed it, I, I highly encourage you to get caught up. But when we are talking about God's kingdom, we are talking about God's rule and reign. If God is the king and that king has a kingdom, then that is the place where God's rule and reign 
happens. That's the place where God rules and reigns over everything that happens. So praying for God's kingdom to come soon implies that there is a need for God's rule and reign, and that it isn't necessarily always here. So we see this at the beginning of Jesus's public ministry in Matthew chapter 4. We read this earlier. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. See, heaven is and already always has been God's kingdom. Things in heaven are the way that things are supposed to be. It's perfect. But then we read the next line, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We see that Jesus instructs us to pray that earth also comes fully under the rule and reign of God. Now here's that phrase again, in heaven and on earth. Remember, this is meant to encompass everything that exists, all of creation, everything we can see, everything that we can't see. We learn a very important truth from Jesus instructing us to pray this way. We learn God's will is not always done on earth. That's why he tells us to pray for it. I'm going to say that again. God's will is not always done on earth. Listen, if you get nothing else from today, I want you to get this one thing. Not everything that happens is God's will. Not everything that happens is God's will. But you say, Pastor Keith, how can this be? Isn't God all powerful? Yes, absolutely. God is all powerful. And not only that, he is all knowing, he is all present, and he is all loving. So how could it possibly be that the will of God, who is all loving and all present and all knowing and all powerful, how could it be that this God's will isn't always happening? I want to tell you a story. See, way back, in the beginning of everything, when God created the heavens and the earth. There's a great book about it. It's in the Bible. It's called Genesis. You should read it sometime. <laughs> God created a perfect creation. He created a perfect earth. And he created people, human beings, in his image, perfect, to take care of and, and live in this perfect earth and to have a perfect relationship with each other and to have a perfect relationship with him. And then really early on, things got sideways. See, what happened is God gave them everything that they needed, but, you know, I wasn't there. I, I don't know exactly how things went down, but, but in a moment of, I don't know, weakness, distraction, I don't know, they decided, hey, we don't have everything that we need. And we actually know better than God who made us and made this and all this stuff for us. And they chose to do something other than what God had instructed them to do. Now, the Bible calls this attitude and the things that we do with this attitude and sometimes the things that we don't do because of this attitude, the Bible calls that sin. And see, God loves us so much that he gives us the choice to either love him back or not. And because of that, because of these sins, well, that's why the world is the way that it is. Sometimes the consequences of the choices that we make, that God gives us free choice to make, have very painful consequences in our lives and in the lives of others. And when Jesus came, he inaugurated God's kingdom, God's rule and reign on earth. But we know for a fact that even in the life of Jesus, all pain, all suffering, all sickness, all death didn't go away. And we still see those things to this day, right? Right? So for the time being, we are stuck in the in-between. We are stuck in the, the already of God's kingdom from when Jesus came, and we are waiting for the not yet of God's kingdom. And when Jesus returns, his kingdom will re return fully with him. But in the meantime, sometimes God's will happens, and sometimes it doesn't. That's why when we pray for the sick, when we pray for the sick, sometimes they are completely healed. And sometimes they are not healed at all. And everything that happens in between. See, if God's will always happened, 
Jesus would not have told us to pray for it. And so we pray for God's kingdom to come. We pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. My action is to pray for God's kingdom to come. My action is to pray for God's will on earth as it already is in heaven. We ask for God's will on earth as it is in heaven when we pray for the sick. We ask for God's will on earth as it is in heaven when we pray and ask and and beg God for healing. We ask for God's will on earth as it is in heaven when we pray for someone to be freed from addiction. Moreover, my action is also to bring God's kingdom where I can. If I belong to Jesus, if you belong to Jesus, then wherever we go, there is the possibility of God's kingdom breaking into the now. The places in the world where we have the power to not only pray for God's kingdom to come, but where we also have the power to actually bring God's kingdom. We need to do that because we never know when it might break in, even if just for a moment. And what an incredible moment that might be. Someone might be healed. Someone might be released from pain. Someone might be set free from addiction. Someone who has lost all hope because of the broken, messed up world that we live in might find hope again because of Jesus Christ. I got to tell you a story. I, gotta tell, I don't have time, I got, but I got to tell you this story because I was talking to Pastor Eddie this morning and we were sharing really cool God stories. And I got to tell you about a time that God's kingdom came. Years and years ago, the first time that my wife and I served at our Thanksgiving giveaway, we were helping to hand out turkey meals to families in need in our community. And when we got towards the end of that giveaway, I got to tell you, we kept counting the turkeys in the freezer and we kept counting the people in the line. And there were more people in the line than there were turkeys in the freezer. But we just kept giving them away. And we had leftovers. We had turkeys left over. So I'm sharing this story with Pastor Eddie, and he reminds me that a few years after that, that we did it again, that we were giving turkeys away, and we kept checking the freezer, and there were not enough turkeys. We counted those turkeys. We counted the people. There weren't enough turkeys. There were too many people. And he looked at me like, I don't know if this is going to work out. And I looked at him, and I said, just keep giving them away. Just you wait. And so we did, and we had leftovers. We never know when God's kingdom is going to break in into a moment. So how do we bring God's kingdom? Yes, by praying for it, but also by doing his will, by feeding the hungry, by clothing the naked, by giving to those in need, by caring for widows and orphans, by ministering to single parents. Our prayers for these things matter, but so do our actions. And when we have the ability to act, we need to act. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Next. Next thing that we learn is that God is our provider. Jesus says, give us today the food that we need. Now the Greek here more literally translates like the New American Standard Bible renders it. Give us this day our daily bread. And we could easily take the concept of bread here and and look for much deeper meaning. This can remind us of the bread that we use when we share in communion and we commemorate Jesus' last meal with his disciples before his betrayal and crucifixion. In fact, in the early church, this prayer was often recited in conjunction with sharing in communion. This can also remind us of something that Jesus says about himself in John 6.35. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And all those things are fine. Those are great things to think about and to be reminded of. But this is literally asking God to provide. That's why the New Living Translation says, give us today the food we need. God, take care of us. God, provide for us. And this is first an acknowledgement that God is ultimately our provider. See, by asking him to supply the food that we need today, we are saying that he is in control. We are saying that it it is ultimately up to him to do it. Now, does this mean that we just wait for God to literally drop food on us? Does this mean we just, we hold out empty plates and we pray this prayer and we just wait for God to manifest food? No. Now, there are a few occurrences in the Bible of God providing food miraculously. But I don't think that's what he's instructing us to pray for here. See, each of the miracle food events were connected to very specific events. Can God do it? Of course. I've seen God multiply turkeys. He's demonstrated that. Is that the way he normally operates? No. 
Asking God to provide for us does not take our own effort out of the equation. Just as praying for God's kingdom to come and for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, it doesn't take away our part, our action out of those things. We put effort into receiving our food each day. Some people grow and raise their food. For most of us here, though, we we work. We purchase what we need with the money that we earn at a job that God provides for us. Well, but Pastor Keith, I got that job on my own. Oh, you did. And how did you do that? Who gave you the capacity to do the things that you need to do to get that job? To complete that specialized training? To complete that certificate program? To get that degree? To perform well in the interview? All of that is from God. Asking God to provide for us is both recognizing that God is our source for everything and that we have an active role to play in that. This means that we also step in for others when they find themselves in circumstances that they don't have the food that they need for today. That's part of our action in bringing God's kingdom. That's why here at the Vineyard, our food bank is open seven days a week. That's why we give away hundreds of backpacks loaded with school supplies every single school year. We have a part to play for ourselves when our circumstances allow it. And we have a part to play for others when their circumstances do not. Because sometimes the way that God provides for us is through others. Sometimes the way God provides for someone else is through me and through you. That's what makes this a dangerous prayer. My willingness to pray this prayer and to mean it means that I have to do something. I can't just sit idly by and wait for God to do the stuff. I have to do the stuff. I pray for God's kingdom to come and then I do what I can within my sphere of influence, within my realm of control. I do what I can to bring God's kingdom. I pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven and then I do what I can to do God's will within my sphere of influence, within the things that are in my realm of control. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. God is our forgiver. We mess up, right? I mean, I know I do. Maybe you don't. Some of you said amen, so some of you are feeling me. This part of the prayer reminds me that I need God's forgiveness every single day. Notice, though, that Jesus doesn't teach us to only ask for forgiveness for ourselves. He says, as we have forgiven those who sin against us. See, my action is to forgive others. This is a single statement. This is a single thought. Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. They go together. You can't have one without the other. The assumption is that we forgive first. He says, forgive us our sins as we have forgiven Wait, really? I have to forgive the people who wrong me in order to receive God's forgiveness? Yeah, I do. I have to forgive the people who wrong me in order to receive God's forgiveness. You have to forgive the people who wrong you in order to receive God's forgiveness. Jesus gives us more insight a few verses later. He says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. It doesn't get much clearer than that. I told you this was a dangerous prayer. If we truly want to follow Jesus, if we truly want to be people of the kingdom, if we truly want to see God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we have to be prepared to pray a prayer like this and we have to be prepared to really mean it. We can't just say it, we have to mean it. All right, now the next truth that this prayer reveals to us is that God is our protector. Jesus says, and don't let us yield to temptation. Here's what we take from this. First, temptation is real. It always has been. And until Jesus returns, it always will be. We see it right at the very beginning, right at the beginning of that story I told you earlier. We see the perfect world that God made, the perfect people that God made, 
the, to inhabit it and to care for it and to live into perfect relationship with each other and with him, we see temptation. The serpent shows up and he tempts Adam and Eve to break the one rule that God had given them to follow. One rule. And they break it. And the rest is why we live in such a broken world. When I make praying a prayer like this, a regular part of my life, I am saying, first of all, to God, that this is a real thing. Temptation is a real thing. And moreover, I am asking God to protect me from failing to that temptation. God, temptation is real. God, don't let me yield to it. God, show me a way out of it. Paul reminds us the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, when you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. When we are tempted, call on God. Remember, we know his name. We can call on him. My action is to call on my father. Call on him. Call on him because he is your friend and you know his name. Call on him because God is our rescuer. Jesus says, don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. We can call on God to protect us when we face temptation because God is our rescuer. God is our deliverer. We have a real enemy. And Jesus tells us in John 10, 10 that the enemy's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. But God, God, our father, our king, our provider, our friend, God is our protector and he is our rescuer. And when we call on him, he will rescue us. Maybe today you need some rescuing. Maybe you need some rescuing from some trouble, from some difficulties in your life. Call on him. He will rescue you. Maybe today you are experiencing, you know, when I, when I talked about fathers, maybe that touched a nerve. And if it did, I'm sorry. But I am confident that God wants to redeem for you the idea of him as heavenly father being nothing like whatever your earthly father was. I believe that. Maybe you got stuck on something in your life that has been a problem for weeks, months, years, that has been trouble, that has been worry, and you've just kind of given up to it as, well, I guess this is just God's will for my life. God's will is not always done. Not everything that happens is God's will. So we are going to pray today together for God's kingdom to come and for God's will to be done on earth, which includes this room, which includes wherever you're joining us online, as it is in heaven. So here's what I want you to do. As best as you can, just dial in to just focus your attention on God and on God alone. Maybe bow your head, maybe close your eyes. Whatever works for you to block out distractions and to focus specifically just on God. And I want you to think about something. I want you to think about something in your life that you need rescuing from. Somewhere that you need rescuer, need a rescuer. Or if... If that idea of father needs to be redeemed in your life, I want you to think about that, okay? Or if there's somewhere in your life where you need healing from sickness, from disease, from pain, maybe you need freedom from addiction, maybe there's just that thing that's been hovering in your life that you have just thought was God's will, and I'm here to tell you right now, it doesn't mean it's God's will just because it's happening. Whatever that thing is, I want you to think about that. And listen, I know it's not going to be everyone, but I know for a lot of us, it's going to be something really, really powerful, really, really strong. So whatever that is, if you're thinking about that thing, I want you to raise your hand just so that we can see where you're at because we're going to pray for you. So raise your hand. Awesome. Okay, great. Okay, keep those hands in the air, please. All right, everyone else, you have a job to do now. Your job is to look around the room and to let God guide your eyes to one of those raised hands. Keep those hands up so we can see them. As high as you can so we can see them, okay? 
And then you're going to do a really brave thing and you're going to go pray for that person. I'm going to help you with it. I'm going to guide you through it, okay? It's okay if you've never prayed for anybody before. It's okay if you haven't taken ministry training, but you're going to go pray for somebody. So I got some brave people already breaking the ice, standing up. So if you're brave and can break the ice, that's going to encourage other people to stand up and go do this too. Thank you. By the way, I will start saying names if lots of people don't get up to go pray. So get on the move. I'm expecting our leaders to do it first, but you don't have to be a leader in this church to do this. You just have to be a follower of Jesus to do this, okay? So go. We want to get everybody covered with their hand raised. If you have your hand raised and somebody hasn't gotten to you yet, give us a little wave so we can see you a little more clearly, okay? Online, I want you to click on that prayer button so that one of our online team members can connect with you and pray for you, okay? So the best as we can, we want to try and get everyone covered. We've got somebody back here on my left, your right, uh, down in this section as well. A couple people over here. Somebody over here, there. The balcony is the hardest to see, so make sure you're looking up there as well. We do have some hands raised up there. Make sure you're waving your hand if nobody is with you yet, okay? Give me a really, really big wave if you don't have somebody with you yet so that I can see and I can direct them. Okay, back over here on my right, your left, down here in the middle right. Let's keep getting these people covered. Go ahead and move around. And if you haven't stood up yet and you're a follower of Jesus, just get up and go, right? I'm going to lead you through it, okay? I'm going to help you out. This is going to be training wheels, okay? Remember, this is, we're asking for God's kingdom to come. The pressure's not on you for something to happen. The pressure's on God, okay? We're just gonna join in whatever he's up to. Let's try and get everybody covered. Anybody who we didn't get covered, if ministry team members, if you're not engaged, small group leaders, if you're not engaged, have a look around and look for those hands waving in the air so that we can get them prayed for, okay? All right. And we're just gonna ask, Holy Spirit, come. You can just say that, Holy Spirit, come. Be here. God, Bring your kingdom. We want your kingdom to come right now into this space, into this area right here in this person's life. You know, find out what their name is. Call them by name. God, we ask for your will to be done on earth in this person's life as it is in heaven. And you can just keep praying those things. If there's a healing, pray for a very specific healing, a specific pain, a specific disease, call it out. God, we ask for your healing in this. Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, heal them from this thing. In the name of Jesus, release this pain. God, in the name of Jesus, we ask for release from this addiction, from this struggle. God, we speak against the lie of the enemy saying that this was just God's will for your life. It doesn't mean this was God's will for your life. We ask for your will to actually be done here in this moment as it is in heaven. Okay, continue praying, continue ministering. Ministry team members, if you are not engaged, I would like you to go ahead and make your way down to the front. Okay, if you're praying for somebody, just keep praying for them, all right? Now, those of you who are receiving prayer, we wanna find out what happened today, okay? The easiest way you can let us know is by filling out that connection card inside your bulletin or online on our app, clicking on the, the online connection card and filling that out and tell us your story. Tell us what happened. Tell us what you got prayer for today and tell us what God did if he did something. We wanna know, we wanna celebrate with you, okay? Ministry team, if you're not engaged, please come down to the front. If you're a small group leader and you're not engaged, please come down to the front so we can cover some ministry time as we close the service in just a moment here. Um, this, this is fun, guys. This is exciting because I'm excited about the stories that are going to come out of this that we'll be able to share with you in the coming weeks and months and celebrate everything that God is up to. If you're not already praying with somebody, if you're not engaged in prayer, will you stand if you're able? I want to pray a blessing over us so that we can dismiss the service. God, we love you, our Father in heaven. God, may we keep your name holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, give us today the food that we need. And God, don't let us yield to temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. And I pray your blessings over everyone gathered here in the room, everyone watching online. Go with us as we leave this place, as we leave these places. And God, use us to bring your kingdom and to bring your will on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week.